It's funny, I was just talking to someone just before this event and we were uh, talking about the state of journalism and the state of media and he said, it's like it's the best of times and the worst of times. Um, I don't know if you remember the rest of that quote, but this is the rest of that quote, which also sort of sounds a little like what's going on sometimes if you look at online media. So um, I'm going to try and get through, I'm going to start with the bad, um, and then we're going to try and I'm going to try and get through it as quickly as possible. And I'm not listing all the bad things because that would take more time than we have. So um, first of all, obviously, this is industries in chaos, newspapers going under, companies going bankrupt, uh, massive layoffs, profits and free fall, and so on. If you pay any attention at all to the newspaper business or even the print media or, or sort of traditional media in general, you, you know what I'm talking about. Has everybody seen this chart? This is called the Cliff of Despair uh, over on the right. Uh, or for Princess Bride fans, uh, the Cliffs of Insanity. Um, that is the, basically the extinguishment of 40 or $50 billion worth of revenue in, you know, comparatively speaking, uh, the blink of an eye. Um, so that, if, you, if you're looking for the sort of culprit for a lot of what's going on, that's, that's it. But obviously that's being driven by lots of other factors. So some newspapers and media companies have declared bankruptcy. Um, at least one that I can think of has declared bankruptcy twice. Um, we may actually have one in Canada that is heading for its second bankruptcy, but who knows? So some have sold themselves to billionaires like Jeff Bezos. Um, others have chosen to put up paywalls. This is my favorite paywall image, anybody who has ever read anything I've written about paywalls, this is one I like to use. Um, very few paywalls actually have barbed wire, uh, literal barbed wire, but um, I think the Globe thought about barbed wire, but they couldn't implement it properly, so yeah. Um, so paywalls uh, obviously have advantages. Um, they can slow the decline of your print revenue, for example, um, but I believe they also stunt your potential growth. And if you look at the media organizations that are growing the most rapidly, they are ones without paywalls. Um, even at the New York Times, which is arguably has one of the most successful paywalls probably in the industry, uh, outside of, say, the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, it still isn't quite making up for the decline in print advertising revenue. Uh, this is what I call, paywalls are what I call a, a sandbag strategy. Um, so sandbags obviously are a good thing. Anybody who's been in the flood knows you need them. Um, it keeps the water from coming in, but it doesn't actually help you figure out why the water's coming in or where the water's coming from or how to build a boat, you know, other important things. So it does protect things, um, but it doesn't actually help you figure out how to get out of that situation. Meanwhile, we've got a lot of online outlets, which some of you may or may not frequent, uh, BuzzFeed, Gawker, and so on. Um, if you if you are not a fan of those sites, then you see them probably as catering to a sort of shallow, um, click-driven, sort of viral content uh, market, and, and experimenting with nasty things like sponsored content, uh, native advertising, and so on. And this is the star of Gawker and BuzzFeed and probably the internet, uh, Grumpy Cat. Um, everybody familiar with Grumpy Cat? No. Anyway, Grumpy Cat uh, probably gets clicked on orders of magnitude more times than all the stories in all the Canadian newspapers that publish online. Um, still grumpy. So um, then, of course, there's crowdsourcing of news in various forms. Twitter obviously would fall into that category. Um, Reddit and other things that have, have been used, I think, in, in interesting ways. But they obviously have their flaws. One is you know, a lack of focus on verification, for example, particularly in the short term, anyone who followed Twitter and or Reddit during the Boston bombings, or in fact any sort of breaking news event, has probably seen, uh, you know, flawed information, uh, misattributed information, uh, some of which actually goes farther and faster than the correct information, which, which is obviously a problem. Um, so, you know, these are, these are sources that, that have interesting elements to them, but you could argue they also have some pretty serious flaws. Um, and just in general, you know, the internet has just acres of information. People can sometimes, I think, suffer from information overload if you're concerned about um, journalism and sort of 
talking to people about things that are important to them, it's hard to, to sort of rise above the level of noise that's out there. Um, some readers, I think, some potential news consumers can get overwhelmed um, by the amount of information that's out there and maybe tune out things that might be important to them. That's obviously one potential flaw. So those are sort of uh, some of the general bad things. Just kind of uh, an overview. Obviously, we could go into depth about any of those, but it's very depressing. So, so let's move on to the good. I think the good there 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 has never really been a better time to be uh, a reader, broadly speaking, to be someone who's interested in in information, news, whatever entertainment, whatever you want to call it. If you like consuming information, this is the, possibly the best time to be alive. I think. Um, if you're interested in sleeping, it's not uh, the best time because there's just so much stuff to read and so much interesting stuff. Um, this is where the sort of stream uh, environment that you get with Twitter is a real danger because it just keeps coming. And if you follow a lot of interesting people like I do, you just can't stop because there's just, you know there's gonna be one more interesting thing and yes, it's three o'clock in the morning or haven't had anything to eat for 75 hours, but, but you just have to read this last, just one last thing. And so that's a good problem to have, I think, if you, if you like consuming information, there's, there's, there's just an endless variety. So virtually anything that you are interested in, no matter how sort of niche it might be, there are massive quantities of information that you might never have gotten, I think, at any other time in history. That's a good thing. Um, Matt Iglesias wrote this at Slate, um, and he got a, quite a bit of sort of negative feedback um, for a bunch of the reasons that I mentioned under the heading of bad stuff. But I think he's right. I think you, if you want to be informed about the news, if you want to be informed about the topics that interest you, you have the ability now to do that in, in farther, faster, deeper than you have ever done before. We have the ability to get information from all sorts of people, not just journalists, not just mainstream sources, not just professionals, from anyone, anyone who happens to be at a place, anyone who happens to be near uh, a news event can commit what Andy Carvin of NPR called random acts of journalism. Uh, which I think is a great way of describing what happens when, for example, a news event occurs. Um, Dave Barry had a great column years and years ago where he said, uh, journalists are very often not at news events unless they occur in a newsroom. So, you know, the people who are at the news events are people who just happen to be walking by. But now they have, they have incredibly powerful video cameras and audio recorders and, and computers at their fingertips and they can share that information with us. And anybody who followed Andy Carvin during the Arab Spring, I think, realized that this is an incredibly powerful um, tool or these tools can be incredibly powerful when used by someone like that to effectively curate in a journalistic way real-time information from people who happen to be at the scene of a news event. This is one that I think, um, in particular, the, one of the co-founders of Twitter said this particular moment was when it sort of crystallized for a lot of people what Twitter was capable of in terms of distributing real-time news. Um, guy just happened to be on a boat, took a picture of a plane, you know. It, it, it not just went out on Twitter, it, it wound up becoming the iconic image of that event on mainstream uh, media sources as well. We can also use these tools, and Andy Carvin again is another great example of this, we can use them to do crowdsource fact-checking and verification. So, so under the heading of bad things, I mentioned how Twitter and Reddit can be flawed in that way, but they can also be incredibly powerful in, in a good way. They can do the, the things that used to take hours or weeks or even months. Um, the kind of real-time verification that Andy was doing and that other people have done in similar events like the uprisings in Egypt is, is fascinating to watch if, you're, if you remember, as I do, being an old person, what journalism was like when you had to actually call people on the phone. Or, so you would have to find somebody in Tahrir Square and actually get their phone number. Or you would have to call your stringer, you know, because you had one guy who was somewhere near there. What, what Andy Carvin had and what every, theoretically every journalist had was the ability to tap into hundreds or, or thousands 
of sources, people who were on the ground experiencing those events. That's a, just a phenomenally powerful thing that we have never really been able to do in the same way. And I would argue that's a, that's a huge benefit. Uh, this guy is a, a British blogger who goes by the name Brown Moses. Has anybody heard of him? No? Brown Moses, uh, I can't remember where he came up with the name, but he, he uh, I believe, was an unemployed uh, accountant. And he became fascinated with the, um, what was going on in Syria. And he started watching YouTube videos of um, weaponry and explosions and so on in Syria. And he, at, at some points, he was watching 100 to 150 videos a night. And he was basically aggregating information from these videos about what kinds of weapons Syrian terrorists were using. And he started tapping into a network of other um, citizen journalists or whatever you want to call them, people in Syria, people with experience in the, in the region, and started verifying these weapons and verifying these techniques to the point where his blog is now being used by people like C.J. Chivers, who is a former Marine who writes about uh, wars and so on for the New York Times, a guy who knows this stuff inside and out, mentioned in one of his reports that Brown Moses' blog was a crucial source of information for him, and in fact lots of aid groups as well. This guy had no training as a journalist, no training to my knowledge in weaponry or any kind of anything like that. Just had a lot of time on his hands, smart guy, managed to create effectively the same thing Andy Carvin did, a sort of crowdsourced network of verification. That's something that just wouldn't have been possible before. So we can get details of things that are happening a world away, and we're not getting those from journalists who got flown in by some giant media entity and dropped on the ground and, and have never been to the region before. We're getting from them from people who are involved in those events, who know the region, who have expertise that we could only dream of getting. And I think that changes the nature of how we perceive that information. Facebook, interestingly enough, during the, the Arab Spring in Egypt, Twitter wasn't as big a, a tool for certainly most of the people who were involved in those uprisings, Facebook was. Because, particularly because of the sort of community building elements of what was happening before those uprisings. And in fact, you could argue, although this is a, a contentious point, you could argue that those revolutions would either not have happened or would have taken much longer if it wasn't for those tools. So you can see that we're getting benefits from both sides, not just they're getting them in terms of trying to organize those events, we're getting them in terms of trying to perceive the effect of those events. This is, a, this is one that's a little bit more controversial with some of my colleagues. Um, we can get input and feedback from readers in real time. That's something that not everybody likes. Um, sometimes I don't like it, uh, but I think it is valuable. And it is something that was, again, not either not possible or only possible in a, in a tiny, tiny, fraction of ways. So for example, if you wrote something in the newspaper, you might get a letter. You might, someone might call the switchboard. Uh, you certainly wouldn't get hundreds or thousands of comments. You wouldn't get people talking about what it was you were writing on Twitter in real time. That can be an incredibly irritating thing, but it can also be really valuable. And I think that kind of real time check on what we do as journalists is, val is fundamentally valuable. It, it forces journalists or in fact anyone to, to in, in real time to respond to criticism, either to defend what you're saying, to, to, to verify what you're saying, and in some cases to correct things that are wrong. And I think we ultimately we all benefit from that. So it may be painful, but it is useful. Also, I, I would argue that even as some traditional media companies are failing, other ones are, are being born. So ProPublica, for example, great story. Um, Nonprofit, charitable funded. Texas Tribune is a very much a similar model just for Texas, uh, growing rapidly. Um, Syria Deeply is one that I got interested in, started by a former broadcast journalist. Um, it's a news site just about Syria. And all of the information comes from either journalists in the region or from people who live in that region. A lot of it is crowdsourced. And of course, we have Pierre Omidyar, uh, who's decided to spend a quarter of a billion dollars on creating a brand new media entity. Um, obviously, having a friendly billionaire is a great business model, but I think um, those, uh, those are some of the examples of 
of new media entities that are being created um, that didn't exist before. In fact, I think yesterday, um, BuzzFeed hired a guy from ProPublica to be the head of their investigative unit. So BuzzFeed, which is best known for cat gifts and listicles and so on, is doing long form serious journalism, building a, a, a serious investigative team that you would associate with something like the New York Times. So the only constant, I would argue, is change. And in fact, the rate of change is not just change itself, but the rate of change is increasing all the time. Um, so this is just a short list of the things that we get now that I th think we didn't really have before. Uh, Real-time news, direct from sources, crowdsource fact-checking, network knowledge and expertise, those things, I would argue, on balance, um, are more of a benefit than the bad things. And I'd also argue that the what we're selling effectively as media, whether journalists or any other form, is trust. It, it, so we're not selling print, we're not selling bits, we're not selling, you know, cat gifts, whatever. It all comes back to the trust that we have, the trust relationship that we have with our readers or the people formerly known as the audience. And feedback that, that I mentioned before, the real-time feedback is a big part of that. that. That exchange of information that you have with those people is a big part of why they trust you and why they come back. So it, it, the bottom line is I believe that the good overwhelms the bad and that the truth ultimately prevails and that people do want to be informed and they do want the truth and they will help you find it and they will help you distribute it and they will help you teach others um, if, you, if you give them a chance. <laughs>